Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul be light. I was just asked a little bit ago about my thoughts on this year, 2017. In fact, just a few days ago <clears throat> was the exact date of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. I'm not sure um, what that day is sig signifying. I presume that is the day that Martin Luther nailed up the 95 th uh, Thesis uh, to the uh, uh, door, I believe, of the cathedral or church at Wurten Württemberg in Germany, if, if my memory serves me correct. Um, my wife here can correct me because she was born and raised in the denomination that is named after him. I don't have a lot to say about this, but what I do have to say, um, I look at the big picture, and as I was thinking about it, I, I was reminded of what Peter said in Acts chapter 3, Uh, let's start in verse 19 of Acts chapter 3. This is Peter speaking to the believers there and up on the Temple Mount, Solomon's porch. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of Jehovah, that he may send Yeshua the Messiah who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things. <clears throat> that scripture is loaded with all kinds of meaning <clears throat> and significance, and I don't claim to understand the full ramifications of that scripture. He cannot come back until the restitution of all things? But um, this I know, <clears throat> when he was on this earth, he brought his kingdom, established his kingdom through his, in and through his disciples, empowered them, gave them the keys of the kingdom, gave them the authority of the kingdom, took it from the ruling religious establishment of its day, gave it to his disciples, his, who he pointed as sent ones, or shalakim, or apostles, and then they were to teach all things, to make disciples and to teach all things that he had commanded. And the early church, the early, early church of the first century, walked in the things that Yeshua taught the disciples and that they taught and preached and established in the churches, in the congregations, the kahilot, the assemblies that, he, that they established throughout the Roman Empire, into the Parthian Empire and beyond. We know from early church history, I'm talking about not it would be post at the post apostolic era so we're talking roughly from let's say 100 AD onward we know that little by little <clears throat> in many respects the church what became known as the church turned away to one degree or another from its the Hebrew or Jewish roots of its faith this is not something that I am making up or others are claiming that is not true. We have the writings of the early church fathers from roughly 110 AD forward. I have their writings in my library. Their writings that have been translated from the Greek. It's a 10 volume set. That's a lot that there is in there. 
and the history is all laid out. And little by little, over the next several hundred years, the church got away from, to again, to one degree or another, away from its Hebrew roots. And eventually, out of that, in the first half of the 4th century, in the 300s, the church at Rome became the dominant church, and it was moving in that direction because it was there at the headquarters of the Roman Empire. So the Bishop of Rome, who was the head of the church in Rome, became kind of asserted himself as the leader over all the churches. Originally, in the apostolic era, Jerusalem was the center of the church because that's where the apostles were. But as the church became Gentilized and as the Jews were forced to leave Jerusalem because of the second Jewish revolt, which happened, the Bar Kokhba revolt in 133 to 135 AD, the Romans banished the Jews from the area around Jerusalem. And little by little, all the bishops of all the early bishops up until that time were all Jewish over the church in Jerusalem. And, and I believe it was after the Bar Kokhba revolt because Jews could not be there or the Romans would kill them. The first Gentile leader or bishop of Jerusalem was appointed. I believe his name was Marcus. Mark, if I remember. I'm pulling this memory out of my memory. Little by little, though, the focus switched to Rome. And as most of you know, in the 4th century, at right around, you know, when the Emperor Constantine, quote-unquote, converted to Christianity and made Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. And shortly after that, he convened what is called the Council of Nicaea, which existed, which lasted be, for two years, two or three years, between A.D. 323 and A.D. 325. And at that point, the church officially and conclusively cut itself off from its Hebrew roots. That's when it was illegal to worship on Saturday and to keep the Passover were two of the big things that came out of that. And you can go read the letters of Emperor Constantine that he wrote to the Bishop of Rome, or to the, uh, the, the bishops that were there at the Council of Nicaea. And you can read his letters that are reprinted in Eusebius's ecclesiastical history. Eusebius was an early church father who lived at that time in the 4th century and reported about the Council of Nicaea. And Emperor Constantine called the Jews very, very evil names and spoke very hatefully against the Jews. So out of that came what we call the Holy Roman Empire. That was in 325 A.D. And anybody that for the next 1,500 years, no, I'm sorry, from three, for the next 1,200, 1,300, about 1,200 years until the Protestant Reformation, which happened, well, in 1517. It, it began with Martin Luther here in Germany. Uh, the seeds of the Protestant Reformation st were started before that. Uh, as people like John Wilk, Wycliffe and William Tyndall were trying to translate the Bible from Latin into the common languages, German, English, and so forth. Um, and that was, so, well, Wycliffe was burned, at the, burned at the, I believe was, was it Wycliffe? I believe he was burned at the stake for that. Uh, Tyndall had to flee for his life. He was in England. Anyway, <clears throat> they were both Englishmen. Uh, and that was back in the, what, 1300s or whenever that was. That was before Will, uh, Martin Luther. So the Catholic Church controlled 
Christianity and anybody that up until that time and anybody that went against the Catholic Church or taught against or taught something different than what the popes of Rome agreed to was killed or banished. That's how the, the Inquisitions came about. You've heard of the Spanish Inquisition. When my wife and I were down in Colombia, South America, last February, at Cartagena, we went into the palace of the Inquisition, and we saw the torture instruments. We took a tour, we had a tour guide, and we saw the torture instruments that the Catholic Church and the leaders of Cartagena, Colombia used to persecute and to torture Jews and what they called apostate Christians. And we saw the pictures and we saw the actual instruments. It was horrific. This is what the Catholic Church did. They burned people at the stake and they tortured them if they would not convert to Catholicism. So when Martin Luther did what he did. He was risking his life. One might say, well, you know, he didn't do very much. If you put yourself in the cultural history of that day, they tried to burn, they would have tried to kill him, torture him, burn him at the stake. None of us have ever done anything in our lives that even comes close to what, Will, what Martin Luther did. The reason he survived is because he went over, I forget, he went over to, a, he was in Germany, he went over to another German um, principality that was favorable to what he believed, and he took protection, if I remember correctly, under that duke or prince or whatever, and the, Roman, the, the Holy Roman Empire couldn't come after him. His big, Roman, uh, Martin Luther's big thing was two things. Sola Scriptura and salvation by faith. By grace you are saved. That was huge because that's not what the Catholic Church taught. This was direct opposition to the authority of the Catholic Church and it was lifting up some truths of the Bible that the Catholic Church had sublimated in order to build its empire. I don't know how many of you have been in the cathedrals in Europe. I have. The biggest and the most famous ones. I've been in there. Some of them took one to two hundred years to build. They're amazing. I've been in cathedrals in uh, not too many, but a few. England, France, Switzerland, Italy, and a few other places. Amazing, these Gothic cathedrals. And post-Gothic, like the one in Rome. They are amazing. It took a lot of power and a lot of money to build those. They controlled the people so the people couldn't even think. So they were all imprisoned mentally and spiritually to the Catholic Church. You could not even read the Bible. They kept the people in ignorance. When Gutenberg came along in about 1415 and invented the printing press with movable type, that began the Protestant Reformation in a sense because now people could have the Bible written in their language or books and people wanted to be educated and to learn how to read. At that time, only the people who could afford an education or who joined the church and became monks or nuns learned how to read or write. This is, why, this is so that the, the people could not read what the Bible really said and learned that what the Catholic Church was teaching them 
was in opposition to that to a very large degree. So that's a little historical background. So what Martin Luther did was huge. Once Martin Luther did what he did and others came along, Zwingli, Calvin, you know, the other reformers, it began to free people's minds so they could read the Bible and discover the truth. This, I believe, was the beginning of the restitution of all things that started to happen in the first century, but got off track because of political and economic influences going on in the, in the uh, Roman Empire, which eventually led to the early church, or the Catholic Church, let's say the church, Eastern and Western Church. Remember, the Roman Empire was divided into East and West, uh, eventually, I think around 500 A.D. <clears throat> and the Western, the, the, the Eastern continued until the fall of Constantinople in about, in the 1500s, or was it maybe, the, uh, maybe 1456, I think it was, I don't remember. And so it continued another thousand years. But, When Martin Luther did what he did, he began to open up, things began to open up, and the Bible was translated into English and German and French from Latin. And people were taught to read, and people could read. And then as they read the Bible, other truths began to come out. So Martin Luther established what became the Lutheran denomination, and other denominations were established. Baptists learned about water baptism, the sprinkling of babies is not biblical. And, uh, and, and the Presbyterians and, and Methodists, well, they came later, they established about church, they learned about church government, and holiness came, and, and all kinds of things. Truths began to be established. And each denomination had a little piece of the puzzle, different truth. And they would break off and start their own denomination, and based on the truth that they had learned. And then another one would break off and start a new denomination based on the truth that they learned. And this went on from the 1500s to the 1600s. Now, it happened in England. It happened in all of Western Europe. And then missionaries were sent out all around the world in contradistinction to the Catholic missionaries who were taught allegiance, who were being taught allegiance to the Pope. The Protestant missionaries were being taught allegiance to their denomination, but to sola scriptura, only the scripture, not traditions of men. Well, as you know, they didn't get rid of all of the Catholic doctrines and theologies, but it was a step in the right direction. And this process continued in the 1700s in England. You had preachers like John Wesley, and you had revivalists like um, uh, Whitfield, George, I think it was George, uh, George Whitfield. In England, you had, or in the United States, you had Jonathan Edwards. You had revivals that took place that brought in new truth. And then in the 1700s, 1800s, you had Finney. You had D.L. Moody, you had Charles Haddon Spurgeon in England, that were preaching revival and, and truths in the Bible, being restored. And there's a lot of other people too. And then denominations were set up around these people. And then new truths would be established. And those denominations didn't want to change and embrace the new truths, so they kicked those people out, and, or, or those people left, and new denominations were started. And out of the, the Wesleyan Methodist holiness movement of the early 19, of the late, of the, of the 1800s, in the early 1900s, out of that movement came the Pentecostal Revival starting in Azusa Street between in California. I've been there. 
in, I think we went there on our honeymoon, we drove by there, a little church, in, in, by San Diego. And it was a little church, it was birthed out of prayer, and that's when people began, the, the, whole, the Ruach was poured out. Now, other people received the baptism of the Spirit down through the ages. We can read histories of that, about that. And, and manifesting the gifts of the Spirit. But it really happened in a big way there, and it spread all over the place. And it went across the United States and all around the world. And then you had other revivals, like the Welch Revival in England. And other revivals broke out, and that was afterwards. That was a few years later. And that was... A further restoration of truth. Yes, not everything in these revivals was perfect. It's, revival is kind of a messy thing. Like everything, you have the good, the bad, and the ugly. You have people that get all passionate. And they sometimes they veer off and go in wrong directions. Or you have the devil that comes in there and mixes, puts impure things in there. <clears throat> That's why we always have to go back to the Bible, back to the Word. Does it line up with Scripture? And if it doesn't, we throw it away. But good things came out of that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. That came out of America. Before America was a totally apostate, like it is now. And then in the 1940s, you had the healing revivals. Praying for the sick, that was another revival. And then you, and that started in America and England, and it went all over the world. And then you had the charismatic renewal, starting in 1960. Hmm. But before that, in the 1930s and the 1940s, you had the Hebrew Roots movement began to get started, or the Messianic movement, or people learning about the Torah. My family comes out of that movement. My grandparents came into that movement back in the early 1950s. On my mother's side. That's where I, that's where I was born and raised in. The early, early Hebrew Roots movement, going back, they came out of the 1930s and 40s. And then in 1960, as I said, you had the charismatic renewal that happened in 1960, and it, that spread through the mainline churches. It first broke out in the Episcopalian Church in America, and then in the Lutheran Church, and the Catholic Church, and, and others. And people were getting filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and, and, and learning about the charismata, the gifts of the Spirit, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 14. And the Pentecostal movement was opposed to that, and the Charismatic movement was opposed to the Pentecostal movement. Eventually, those merged. I was in a Foursquare church for a few years in the 1990s, and the Foursquare was one of the early denominations. The biggest denomination to come out of the Pentecostal movement was the Assemblies of God. And then, right after that, the Foursquare came out, and I was in that church. And the pastor stood up, and he called himself, we're a charismatic church. I thought to myself, no, you're te technically you're Pentecostal. But by that time, the charismatics and the Pentecostals had merged to one degree or another. So often these things, these truths merge as they learn to accept each other. And so I was raised in the early Hebrew Roots movement or Messianic movement or Torah Restoration movement on my mother's side of my family, my, starting with my mother's parents, my grandparents, but then my, my father's father on my dad's side, he, was, he sat under the pastor of the, the, the man who was called the father of the charismatic renewal. He received the baptism of the Spirit in, 19, in the 1960s, he and my grandmother, and he was discipled by the man who's called the father of the charismatic renewal, that the charismatic gifts broke out in his church in 1960. He was the first church, the mainline church. It was an Episcopalian church. And my grandfather comes out of that. So I 
got the Hebrew roots from my grandparents on my mother's side and the charismatic, the gifts of the Spirit from my grandfather on my father's side and the Spirit and the truth came together. And I didn't realize what this was all about until, until about the year 2000. And I realized, but anyway, not to focus on me. So all of these things are restorations preparing for the second coming. So you had the charismatic renewal. And at the end of that was the Jesus people movement. And then in the 1960s, there was the second advent, if you will, of the Hebrew roots movement. That's when the Jews for Jesus movement, what I call the Jews for Jesus movement, started. And that was, I was raised in the early Hebrew roots movement, but we didn't have a love for the Jewish people. We, didn't, we weren't anti-Semitic, but we just didn't appreciate them and the land of Israel. But the Jews for Jesus movement, which started in the 1960s, loved the Jewish people and showed the church you need to love the Jewish people and love the land of Israel. And that brought another dimension into this, which is wonderful. But let's not stop there, because they promoted the Jew-Gentile paradigm, which is a non-biblical paradigm. The paradigm that the Bible promotes is called the one new man, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. It's the body of Yeshua. It's the one new man. It's the Israel of God, the Israel of Elohim, who, G G Galatians 6.16 and Galatians uh, 3 verse 28 and 29 there's neither Greek nor Jew or Jew and Gentile and those that come in by the blood of Yeshua are the one new man that's uh, Ephesians 2 and they are called the Israel of Elohim and the in Galatians 6 16 and they are called the seed or the sperm or the offspring of Abraham Galatians 3 29 that is the church that is those who are under the blood of Yeshua and so it was great that we had restored to us the love of the Jewish people and the Israel because we're connected to our Jewish brethren. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't sufficient either. Mm -hmm. There's more. Then along, that was what we call the Messianic Jewish movement. Then in the late night, or starting in the early mm -hmm. 1980s, Yah raised up some people who I know, my wife and I know, who taught about the restoration of all the tribes of Israel, not just the Jewish people, but it's called the Messianic Israel Movement. Not Messianic Jewish, praise the offer, the Messianic Jews that come to know Yeshua, but the Messianic Israel. And we learned that all of the, all Christians who are born of Yeshua are part of Israel, what we call redeemed Israel, Messianic Israel. And that the Messianic Israel, or Ephraim, and all the northern tribes will come together in fulfillment of numerous prophecies in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. The, 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 the primary one of which is found in Ezekiel 37, the two sticks prophecy. And that, is the, that was the next step in the restoration of truth. Now, I was raised um, with a, some understanding of that, and my, my parent, my grandfather, began to study that in the 1940s, though he was still in a Sunday church. But, and so I was raised with an understanding that I was part of redeemed Israel, but I didn't understand the prophetic implications until Angus and Vati Wooten came along. And taught those truths which are totally scriptural and biblical anybody that teaches otherwise is promoting a false paradigm and is <coughs> resisting the restitution of all things and most of them that are promoting that false paradigm are doing so because of money power and pride and are trying to maintain a form of racist uh, 
Jew-Gentile paradigm. So this is th this all started with 500 years ago with Martin Luther, as I see it as a student of history. And where does it all go next? I'm not sure what the next restoration of truth is. But we want to be open to it because, as we said from Acts 3, Yeshua will come back. He will come back when the restitution of all things occurs. And we are part of that restitution, and I'm not sure what is next. But praise Yah for Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers who started the ball rolling 500 years ago. Amen. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, come and eat.